Uh, uh, you, you said you, you're in Hodge Hill, you're the vicar at Hodge Hill on Furs and Bromford. Just tell us a bit about that place. So we're on the edge of the city, uh, on the edge of Birmingham, uh, just on the, uh, the border between uh, Birmingham City Council and Solihull Metropol Metropolitan Borough Council or whatever they are. Um, we are, um, so in Anglican terms, we're a parish of about 20,000 people. Uh, about half of them are Muslim, most of them uh, with Pakistani heritage. Um, and the rest are a fascinating mixed bag. So I live on the Furs and Bromford estate, which is a typical 1950s, 1960s council estate uh, built out on the edge of the city. Um, what uh, was called uh, the clearance of the slums, so people uh, with their roots in Aston in the back-to-backs uh, were moved out to Fairs and Bromford as this wonderful um, kind of idyllic new place with lots of green space and those wonderful villages in the sky uh, that uh, they called skyscrapers in those early days, um, which are on their way to being torn down now. We've, uh, we've got about four left. Um, and the rest is terraces and masonettes on the whole. Um, and again, kind of historically a white working class estate, um, but the, these days about 50% um, of the estate is, is white still. And the other 50% is a glorious mix of different uh, nationalities and ethnicities, um, including quite a large Somali population, quite a large Nigerian community. Um, quite a number of different Eastern European groups as well. So it's an area that's been quite fluid over the 10 years that I've been here, um, but is getting increasingly ethnically diverse, uh, which is fascinating. But it's also an area um, that uh, in the kind of statistics of doom uh, is, is up there um, in all kinds of ways that we're not uh, particularly uh, delighted by um, Hodgehill constituency has, I think, the worst rates of child poverty in the country, um, for example. Um, but there are other stories uh, that we can tell about our area as well, and hopefully get the chance to tell a few. I'm sure there'll be that opportunity. And um, I guess uh, it, it's important to have that kind of sense of locatedness for you. And uh, just in some of the work that you've been doing, in terms of uh, research and writing, that locatedness seems to be something that's always right at the forefront of your imagination and what you're kind of contemplating, what you're trying to convey. Um, I guess in practical theology terms, uh, the way that you do this is it, not that kind of neat pastoral cycle. It feels like your thinking and your practice are kind of constantly in dialogue with one another and with your thesis you talk about radical receptivity and it's a phrase that uh, uh, that's got picked up by a lot of people and used by a lot of people do you want to just give us a kind of heads up about what you mean when you use that phrase yeah sure um so to to start with a little bit of a story um when i arrived in hodge hill the anglican congregation here were two years out of uh losing their building and it was a building that had been a, a 1960s purpose-built multi-purpose community center um, quite pioneering and cutting edge in its day um, where loads of stuff happened every day of the week every week of the year um, and when i arrived here folk from that congregation were saying we don't know how to be church anymore we don't know how to do mission anymore because we did it with our building. People came to us, stuff happened there. That was where community happened. Um, and so the challenge for us together over those first few years um, was to work out how to be church and how to do mission without a building. Um, and the question that kind of formed in my head in quite early days here was, how can we as church be open to the gifts and the challenges of our neighbours in a way that transforms us as much as anything that we do transforms them? Um, and I think, you know, that 
that was the question that ended up being the heart of my PhD. That's the question we've been exploring in all kinds of practical ways over the years here. Um, seeing Anne on this call is, is wonderful because um, Anne's books uh, were profoundly influential in terms of the way I approached here, uh, the kind of mindset uh, that, that I arrived in Hodge Hill with. Um, and I think, um, and your books, good, uh, Beyond the Good Samaritan and Journeying Out, certainly, were the ones that kind of asked the question about, you know, is, is church about running projects? Is church about doing stuff to people? Or actually, is there a more liberating, transforming possibility that sees our neighbours as, as gifts? Um, and particularly in the midst of that owns our, and I say our in terms of the church, in Hodge Hill and the church more broadly, are largely middle-classness and kind of, you know, recognises that certainly in, in this setting here, that's the majority of our congregation and certainly the way the culture of church um, has been set up over years. And kind of, you know, let's, let's acknowledge that and let's acknowledge that a certain power comes with that. Um, but let's try and work out ways of being with our neighbours that that doesn't abuse that power or reinforce that power imbalance but actually tries to flip it um that says you know what what does it look like if we the church come with empty hands um what does it look like if we realize and admit to ourselves that we don't know what the good news is for this place um, and that actually, if we're going to, uh, if we're going to be witnesses to that good news, we need to we need to have our eyes open to to work out what it might look like here. We need to have our ears open to listen for it in our conversations with our neighbours, and let's discover what that good news is together. So, in some ways, that kind of question drove the quest of kind of well, how do we? Was it a kind of grasping after language that, that would help you kind of make sense of what you were beginning to observe and beginning to practice? So, I mean, I think, as you said in the beginning, actually, it's, it's been a messy process. It's not, it's not been a linear one by any means. Um, if anything, kind of a spiral might, might do ju some justice to it. Um, but actually, at similar times we were both trying to be a certain way in our community with a bit of a hunch but also we were going through the work as a church of trying to articulate a mission statement and and some core values um, and certainly in in that as a church we came up with growing loving community in the love of god with all our neighbors across Hodgkill. Um, and we found ourselves articulating five core values that were compassion, generosity, trust, friendship and hope that were things that we wanted to say we recognise these in God. But we also recognise these in our neighbours. And we also want to try and embody these in our life together and in our life with our neighbours. So uh, that was some of what was going on and actually we were recognizing those values in our neighbors as we went out and talked to them and and heard their stories so that was one bit of it another bit of it was that three of us went on a two-day training course on something called asset-based community development in early 2012 um and we went on the course thinking it sounded a bit like what we were doing instinctively so it felt like it might be worth might be worth exploring and, and that was one of the places where we found, as you say, kind of language and a bit of a framework that, that described what we had a hunch for um, and enabled us to do it more intentionally. And certainly over the years since, uh, we've journeyed, particularly with Cormac Russell, who's been one of the sort of leading lights in ABCD, um, both in the UK, but also in other bits of the world. And, and Cormac's helped us kind of nuance some of that language and and find some some ways of expressing some rules of thumb in all of that um so for example again to go back to power relationships are we doing things to people are we doing things for people are we doing things with people 
or actually are the things that are happening being done by our neighbours? Um, and and Cormac has been one of the people that that has nudged us again and again into what he calls the buy space, um, and and that's that's been a hugely helpful bit of the journey. But I think as as we've journeyed on, we've found bits of A B C D that kind of great a bit, or or we've wanted to say yes, but or yes and. Um, and also, I think as we've journeyed on, we've also wanted to flesh it out more theologically and, and actually find some, some theological language and some theological frameworks that, that are richer and deeper and broader than what ABCD as a kind of, you know, a, a model of doing community development um, offers. And is that where the kind of receptivity really comes into its own? Is that the kind of... Uh, beyond beyond a b c d a kind of theological take on it or yeah so i mean what a b c d would talk about in terms of something like the church would was it, it would name the church as an institution in the community um and and it would also name uh ways in which institutions can be a force for good in a community uh, so cormac talks about you know, the choice between an institution as a fortress that is kind of, you know, constantly drawing up its drawbridge and, and just making sure its own survival is the priority, or an institution that's a treasure chest that kind of discovers treasures that it can open and say, say to the, the community, you know, come and dive in and, and find the stuff that might be helpful. So an institution as an asset in that sense. Um, but actually what I've been wanting to do and what we as a church have, have been doing here has been to say, as church, we're more than that, but we're also different to that. You know, we acknowledge that we have an institutional dimension that can both be a resource and an asset, but also can often be toxic and unhelpful and, and fortress-like. Um, but also actually, we want to be a learning community we want to be a community of disciples and so part of that is we want to say we want to in our encounters with our neighbors we want to discover God in those encounters we want to be transformed by those encounters we want to be to change to be changed and to to learn and to grow through those encounters um, and I think we've discovered that a lot of that learning and growth can be really quite hard. Mm. Um, but can be immensely liberating as well. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, the language of receptivity is about about trying to get under the skin of what what kinds of gifts and challenges might we discover in those encounters with our neighbours. But also, and I, I realised towards the end of the the five and a half years of of my PhD that while I thought I was writing a PhD on how can the church be radically receptive to the gifts and challenges of our neighbours. Actually, I was mostly writing a PhD on what are all the ways that the church resists being radically receptive to the gifts and challenges of our neighbours. <laughs> and it, it, it feels like actually, and certainly for an institution like the Church of England, it's important to name those resistances and those obstacles and those uh, temptations um, so, that we, so that we're clear sighted about them, so that we, we, we see them, so that we can then work out what to, how to kind of get them out of the way. Yeah, I was thinking of um, Walter Brueggemann's thing from Prophetic Imagination earlier today about that you dismantle the old order in order to energise a new order and in some ways naming some of those barriers, naming some of those hindrances is part of that dismantling the process yeah. in order to receive. And um, I guess one of the things that I'm really, uh, it's really helpful to hear um, from you is you know in in terms of what did that look like and what does that look like on the ground and i'm thinking particularly in terms of covid because you know it's one thing to be able to be out and about in the the world connecting with people experiencing gift from the other uh in in a, in a normal time but what about covid when actually we're all kind of cocooned into our own places how how on earth does that work out in practice yeah so before March 2020, 
um, if you'd asked me what we did locally and how it worked, I would talk about finding and sometimes creating the bumping spaces where you know neighbours naturally just sort of gather together and bump into each other and get to know each other, where strangers turn into friends, where we share food together, where we have conversation, um, where if people turn up um, with a presenting need, with something that they want sorting out, um, we try and uh, reframe the conversation to to discover also you know what passions and gifts and skills they come with and what we can support them to uh, to work out how they can share with their neighbors um, and of course you know covid has has meant that words like gathering words like bumping spaces uh, become things that we are not just afraid of but also you know legally <laughs> um health wise have to avoid mm -hmm. have to have to risk manage um and find find ways of getting around so it has changed radically um before covid uh, one of my sort of constant strap lines was how can we resist the temptations to the power of the provider the performer and the possessor um the, the three temptations of jesus in the in the wilderness um and and during covid times i, I found myself in this in this quite ambivalent situation where on the one hand i've i've looked around both in terms of what we've found ourselves having to do locally but also in terms of what colleagues are, are doing and talking about doing in other places and those three temptations to the power of the provider the performer and the possessor feel like they've never been more visible never been more um in some ways necessary um because people have been hungry so someone's had to feed them or find the food or enable them to to find food um you know in in church terms uh so much has had to go online so uh, many of my clergy colleagues have had to work hours and hours every week creating presentations performances to to broadcast um to their congregations um and you know questions about what territory can we control what territory do we need to manage and how can we manage it as carefully and as safely as possible you know the question of the the possessor um you know all of that is really live and challenging stuff yeah uh that we've that we've found ourselves in one way or another having to to move into in one way or another here but also wanting to resist each of those as as temptations to power so you know we've we've had a fairly significant uh, role in distributing food locally um but what we've what we've wanted to do one thing that we've done is we've resisted the council's coordination uh program across birmingham where they've appealed for volunteers from across the city to literally sort of drive into neighborhoods drop food on people's doorsteps and and drive away we've said you know if you've got referrals locally we want them because we want our neighbors to be knocking on our neighbors doors mm. because actually as well as dropping off a food parcel we want that to be an opportunity for conversation mm. we want that yeah. to be an opportunity for someone to say i live just down the road if if you want anything in the next few days give me a buzz or mm. actually if you want to chat let's go for a walk together mm. Mm. um so you know we we want to shift the providing into something that is more about encounter and and friendship and neighborliness um we found the bumping spaces inevitably have most of which have closed for the moment um which has been a deep loss a deep grief um and you know both those of us that were in the middle of of making them happen but also those uh, who who came week by week um and 
the way we do things here, actually the boundaries between those two uh, have always been blurred, um, have, have, you know, have profoundly missed those spaces. And people who a year ago were saying, do you know what, my life has changed because I used to sit in my house watching telly and getting depressed and feeling profoundly lonely. And now, you know, I'm in these spaces and, and I've got this massive extended family and, yeah. you know, we see each other several times a week. And, and I just, you know, my life feels so full, yeah. are again saying, I'm stuck in my house in front of the telly, I'm feeling lonely and isolated and depressed. So, you know, some of that we've not found, because I don't think there is a way to translate that into a different mode. You know, we, we as a church made the decision in March to not try any way of celebrating the Eucharist from week to week and part of the reason we did that was because there were profoundly Eucharistic spaces in our community that were not able to gather in any form and actually our Sunday Eucharist only made sense in the context of that network that ecology of other Eucharistic spaces so you know a lot of that is on hold and profoundly hard what we have found is that the bumping space is now the doorstep uh -huh. the door the doorstep is now the threshold that that liminal space of encounter um so our street connecting team that before covid were going out once a week are now going out three or four times a week knocking on doors door by door simply starting with how are you um and certainly us brummies uh before this year if someone asked you how how are you you'd say yeah all right um and and that would be the end of the conversation but do you put on the accent as well Cal? Uh, no you... no <laughs> I, I i fail miserably to to uh, to sound like most of my neighbors unfortunately it, it, it sounded almost from me that it was very good <laughs> um my my children are much better at it than me um, <laughs> good but 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 actually even that question we found on the doorsteps now will will open up all kinds of stuff that is depth um you know people will burst into tears when someone on their doorstep says how are you um obviously we're not able to hug people but but we've tried to find the the most kind of sort of facial and yeah. verbal ways of of giving people a hug on the doorstep yeah. um and those encounters they they've been profound and they've also opened up new things um you know the possibility of one block of flats uh working on developing their communal garden together yeah. started with conversations on the doorstep of a few flats where Door, doorstep by doorstep the same story was being told about how mm. the communal garden was rubbish and how the council weren't doing anything about it and all we our street connecting team needed to say was well how about how about if you did it yourselves how about if you did it mm. with, with your neighbor mm. um and the wonderful thing about our our blocks of masonettes here of um it's a block of six flats in each block um is basically they've said it's a communal garden we're a bubble you know let's let's forget this social distancing thing mm -hmm. between our households because there's no way we can share mm -hmm. a small garden together without without mixing together so um so they at least one of our blocks just at the back of my house have transformed their garden um simply after those conversations on the doorstep yeah. where our street connector said you know what your neighbor said exactly the same thing five minutes ago why don't you why don't you have a chat with them and and see what you can do together yeah that's really helpful i i like the idea of this doorstep and i'm i'm wondering you know when you talked earlier about receptivity it was very and the, the kind of opening questions of what gifts do do our neighbors bring to us and i guess just to push you a little bit on the doorstep um how how does the neighbor give to you as you know add to your street connector team because the examples you've given so far are, you know, that the impact it's had for the person answering the door. How does that become a, a mutually receptive space? Sure. Where, yeah, and, and, and questions of power that you're always very close to. What, what, how do you read that power in that kind of engagement? So for uh, what, one of the most profound experiences this year, um, 
was a, a community iftar, um, a fast breaking in the month of Ramadan. Um, for a few years here, we've had a bit of a tradition of, of doing a community iftar, uh, which certainly until last year was largely led by uh, the men of the mosque. Um, it was mostly their thing um, and uh, they would kind of ma make it happen and uh, some of us Christians and other neighbours in the community um, did did a lot of the inviting and 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 some of the practicalities behind the scene but but it was sort of it was it was the big cheeses it was a bit of an official thing um last year there were there were two iftars there was the sort of the, the big official one and there was a small group of women uh from different faith communities that met together to to share and they shared stories together on an evening and this year we'd planned to to build on that second one uh to try and do something that drew in more people and then of course um covid happened lockdown happened and the planning group which was a group of uh muslim women locally but also um several women who wouldn't call themselves muslim wouldn't call themselves christian um were mostly of a, a sort of white british ethnic background um but loved their neighbors and and wanted something like this to happen and wanted to learn um so they started planning uh before covid hit and and then the question was well can we do anything anyway and and that little group decided that we needed to do something anyway and so what we ended up doing and it was really quite small was um us christians and other non-muslim neighbors decided that we would fast with our muslim neighbors for a day um you know, we, we we felt a bit pathetic and a bit fraudulent <laughs> for just doing a day because, you know, when when, when you're a Muslim, <laughs> yeah, well, you know, when when you're a Muslim fasting for a month, that you know, what's yeah. what's a day? But it, it, and but, that particular but, month as well. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 for for us, you know, that felt like what we could manage this time around, um, and. And what was amazing, well, several amazing things about it. So we had a little WhatsApp group. Uh, so we were communicating with each other during the day and our Muslim uh, friends were, were kind of encouraging us and saying, you know, the first few hours is the worst. Once you got over the first few hours, it will get a bit better. And they, they were sending wonderful, encouraging messages during the day when some of us were just getting a bit grumpy and moany and kind of just, just not, not very nice to be around. Um, <laughs> And then in the evening, each of our households that was involved cooked um, something. Uh, and then there was a bit of a, an amazing sort of COVID safe or COVID risk managed um, food distribution operation. Um, so, you know, food appeared on our doorstep and, and I'd, I'd made a curry earlier and kind of sent, sent out bits um, that were then distributed to others. So we all, we all ate together uh at the fast breaking at the end of the evening in our different houses um and messaged each other on whatsapp to say you know the food's amazing thank you so much you know, <laughs> wonderful we made it got to the end of the day um and then the next day we we met on zoom uh and reflected together for about an hour um and we finished with one of our muslim sisters led us in a blessing um, from the Quran and most of us were in tears uh, you know it was it was a moment where actually you know those of us who had done our slightly pathetic day-long fast um, but had, had struggled along the way had literally been encouraged every step mm. had our hands held metaphorically by our Muslim neighbours um, and at the end of the experience and having reflected together on on how it felt and where the struggle was and where we'd found joy in it all, we were blessed by our Muslim neighbours. And, you know, that that was a hugely profound gift. And 
a couple of a couple of our Muslim neighbours afterwards said, actually, it was a real privilege for them to be able to lead us through this as well, and that they had felt blessed by being in that role. Mm. Um, but I, I guess for me, that's just one example of of that sense of of when we relinquish our our sense of needing to needing to lead the way the whole time, needing to know what we're doing. Mm needing to be the people that bless others. Um, actually, something profound happened for all of us. Yeah, I, I, we're going to split into groups in a minute, but I, I have one more question that kind of leads, that, that your last comment really leads to, which is I remember speaking to you early on in lockdown and kind of going, I think both of us were saying, oh, I just can't get a head around this, cannot quite work. Uh, what on earth is going on? And I don't know, you, you're... you're probably way more profound than I am but that it, it feels like that is a constant replaying uh, sense throughout this time I'm really interested how have you sustained yourself in those moments where you've you know you talked about loss and grief of not having those bumping in places how have you kind of negotiated this as a human being uh, during these last few months um various ways some uh some better than others um uh, Janie and I've drunk more wine over the last few months than I think we've ever drunk before um uh and and actually I, I think in our in our family all the things that used to be kind of rare treats before lockdown we're just we're treating ourselves to more frequently and more often and actually you know there's lots of chocolate being consumed in this house as well <laughs> Um, when we've been able to, uh, and certainly during that first period of lockdown, the daily walk together as a family mm. was a vital thing for me, for my mental health and well-being. Um, just being able to get to a point in the day where I said, I am not working anymore. Um, let's, let's go out and connect together a bit. Um, and uh, connect with our uh, environment around us and breathe some fresh air and and just you know move our feet and wave our arms around and, and stuff that that was really essential um, getting it I, I, I've realized when I've been stuck with the three other wonderful human beings who I share a house with um, I've realized how much of an introvert I am and how normally I took for granted that I'd have most of most days on my own in the house um, and that kind of going out to community events was 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 a source of joy because it, it was you know it, it, my life was fairly balanced in that way um, being stuck in a house and not having that that quiet space to myself I've found really hard at times and uh, getting out on my bike has been one of the things that's been a real lifeline to just kind of have a bit of introvert space and um get some get some miles under my belt and breathe breathe and and just the rhythm of cycling has been important to me so yeah that's been some of it um well one of the things that i found people ask me over the last few years um the the more i've ended up talking in in circles beyond the local is could this work in my place um or um and another variant of the same question is uh does it does it have to be in a um or um could this work in a middle class community um and i think uh, what one of the things that we've worked really hard to resist in hodge hill is turning it into a model um turning it into a franchise that can be sort of lifted and packaged and and sold to other places because i don't i i, I don't think it is like that um i think what it is is a mindset shift and so for us in church language it's a conversion um and so I think for for us, the the practicalities 
of working it out in other places almost have to start with the uh, like jesus's ministry started with both that with that combination of the affirmation of his identity as a beloved child uh in which uh he can then be rooted to withstand the temptations to to prove his worth and value in any other way that is more tangible and and visible and and demonstrable um and and the resistance of the temptations and the kind of the unpicking of those power relationships so that that's kind of a help an unhelpful non-answer in a way but there, there's kind of a negative theology going on here that some of it is about actually let's identify where where actually the power is out of whack and let's resist those and then let's see what emerges in those spaces um and i think one of the things that we've that we've found here more than anything else is that when we when we don't do something often there's often uh, often a space uh emerges where other people do start doing things so one of the things that's happened during covid here is that neighbors have set up food tables uh outside their houses and neighbors have donated food and other neighbors have picked up food and actually that's not needed us and our organization uh to get involved and manage it that's that spontaneous neighbor care um so some of it is is about just kind of stepping back from those spaces but i think it's not a stepping back that's abandoning um it's a stepping back that's rooted in that desire for friendship um see what emerges from that my phd started with a consciousness of a class difference between me and the majority of my church and the majority of my neighbors and it ended up realizing that actually so much of this is about whiteness mm -hmm. um and uh, like i said earlier actually a lot of a lot of this naming of the resistances and naming of the obstacles certainly in a church of england context was actually realizing that so much of our dominant imagination about mission and i'm talking about anglo catholics talking about mission as much as i am evangelicals talking about mission is is rooted in a colonial mindset is 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 entangled with empire and not just our history of empire but our our imagination of empire that is about kind of expanding our territory outwards um it's about going out and seeing commodities that we can pull in often those commodities are people um and it's about kind of at its most benevolent but still toxic uh it's about going out and and sort of you know bringing our brand of civilization to to people that are clearly in need of it um and and all of those actually you know once once i realized that some of that was about naming whiteness um a whole new set of questions open up so one of the questions uh that i i discovered towards the end of my phd was from jennifer harvey who's a critical white theologian in the states who says do you know what us white people when we talk about our relationships with our others with our neighbors we we stick ourselves in jesus's shoes we ask uh, we ask the what would jesus do question um or or we do the saint teresa of avila version of it which is much more poetic and and you can't fit it on a wristband um you know christ has nobody but ours no hands no feet but ours etc um but actually what we're doing is where we're putting ourselves in that center stage space we're filling the space uh with with ourselves um and imagining that we have divine authority for it and jennifer harvey says us white people we need to disidentify with jesus and we need to ask the question what would zacchaeus do because actually zacchaeus is is a much better character for us in our whiteness to to identify with because he benefits from the system as it is 
he's you know he's used the system to his advantage over the years and when he encounters jesus who in this weird moment um kind of invites himself to tea and hosts hosts the party and zacchaeus discovers that he's a he's a guest um zacchaeus realizes that the only way he can follow jesus is by betraying the system that has benefited him um, and he starts betraying the system by renouncing all the ways that that he'd previously profited it from it by distributing all the stuff that he'd he'd pulled in um for me reflecting a bit further along the way i found myself drawn to the foot of the cross in mark's gospel and realized that for many years i've identified with the group of women who followed Jesus faithfully to the end and who stood and watched from a distance. That faithful presence, that faithful listening close to the cross, that he is Jesus crying his God forsakenness. And they have been an immensely powerful symbol for me of, of church. But realizing and acknowledging my whiteness, I realize that actually I'm the Roman centurion. I'm, you know, I am the representative of empire at the foot of the cross, whose job is to make sure this guy dies, and whose job is to keep people like that bunch of women away from the action, and to stop them causing trouble. And, and the question for me then became, well, you know, if he's genuine in his acknowledgement that this is truly the son of God, and so therefore Caesar isn't the son of God, and so therefore the empire that employs him is a sham. Uh, you know, what does he do the next day? Does he hand in his resignation? How does he negotiate his identity as a Roman citizen in Jerusalem, where, you know, he's part of the occupying army? And, and if he's anything like me and longs to be part of that bunch of women uh, who were faithful to the end and watched and waited and will come back and be the witnesses of resurrection how on earth does he get anywhere near them in a way that is anything other than threatening uh the risk of of violence um and harm and and so i one of the things that 2020 has done for me and it's for me it's been a combination of Black Lives Matter in the wake of George Floyd's murder, um, Azariah France Williams' book, Ghost Ship, um, documenting decades of institutional racism in the Church of England, um, and also um, an awareness of the disproportionate uh, deaths uh, of, uh, from COVID amongst um, black and other minority ethnic communities in this country. Um, and also some conversations locally within my own congregation where some of my African Caribbean heritage congregation members have said, do you know what? We've been saying this for years. Um, I've been left with the question of myself, what took you so long? You know, how have you got to 44 and almost 20 years ordained in the Church of England and 10 years uh, vicar of Hodge Hill, and now you want to think about racism? You know, why, why has it taken so long? Um, and so part of it for me is, is grief at this point. Part of it is, is the joy of being able to hear the stories of my African Caribbean sisters and brothers in my congregation uh, in ways that I've never heard before that are also stories of heartbreak. Um, and part of it is the question of, well, how, how do I start betraying the system that has benefited me for, for the last 44 years of my life? Um, and just very briefly, and then I'll stop, because uh, I realise I've talked a lot. Um, one, of, one of the wonderful unexpected gifts of, of writing this book with Ruth Harley being interrupted that's uh, coming out a week on Monday, quick plug there from SCM Press, 20% off at the moment, um, is, is that we've been able to be in conversation uh, with some people that we've invited um, in uh, as uh, as invited interruptions kind of we've said 
we'd love you to engage with us not to not to be sort of fawning and enthusiastic over our work but but just to say actually this is where it resonates for me and actually this is where it leaves me cold and this is where you've got it wrong and this is where the gaps are and one of those last week was Azariah France Williams um, and and we were talking about the Roman centurion image and in that chapter in the book uh, we name four R's for those of us with privilege. And I think this is this applies to race, but also to class and gender, amongst other things. We talk about the need for relocation into spaces of encounter, relinquishing of, of our privilege and, and of the things, of the systems that benefit us, receptivity to hear the challenges of others, and reparation, that, that process of kind of working out what, what we do. Um, and as Ariah said, you know, thank you for those four R words, and they're good to hear from a, a white middle class male. Um, but actually, they're not words that work for me. Uh, and he offered us four O words to go alongside our four R words that, that worked for him. So when I said relocation, he said occupation. This is our space. When I said relinquishing, he said ownership. It's actually this is this is for for us, as I said, you know, this is claiming what what belongs to us, that so often has been stolen from us. When I said receptivity, he said objection. Actually, you know, in in what ways can those who have been pushed to the edges by privilege raise objection and say this this is not good, this will not do. Um, and when I said reparation, he said opportunity. You know, what could be possible? So that's been, that's been one of the little gifts of, of this year uh, and the combination of, of flows that have led me to where I am now, but, but a, a beginning of another conversation, I think.